This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, your weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is July 12, 2016, and I'm your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, cuboids? Christina Roach. Hello. And producer Pat. Hi, everybody. We have three interesting segments for you. Christina is going to explore whether 2016 has been atypically bad for celebrity deaths. And then Adam is going to look into whether cell phones cause cancer. Mm -hmm. But first, do you need to drink eight glasses of water a day? Have you noticed how often people carry water bottles around? Whether at a meeting, in a classroom, or out for some activity, many people have them because they believe it is important to stay hydrated. I can recall Oprah being a believer in drinking eight glasses of water a day, and many people believe this is what they need to be healthy. Now, one cup is about eight ounces, which is 250 milliliters. So that's two liters for us Canadians, but eight cups of eight ounces for the imperialists. This is why it's also known by the eight by eight rule. But is it true? The American Journal of Physiology was also curious to know this, so they invited Dr. Heinz Valton to review the literature. Who is Valton, and does he deserve our benefit of the doubt? Well, in addition to being a professor emeritus of physiology at Dartmouth Medical School, Valton is also a kidney specialist and author of two widely used textbooks on the kidney and water balance. Better than some hack that only wrote one textbook on kidneys and water balance. <laughs> <laughs> what did he find? Well, Dr. Valton found no scientific studies in support of needing to drink eight glasses of water a day. Huh. Instead, here's a quote, surveys of fluid intake on healthy adults of both genders published as peer-reviewed documents strongly suggest that such large amounts are not needed. His conclusion is supported by published studies showing that caffeinated drinks, such as most coffee, tea, and soft drinks, may indeed be counted toward the daily total. Yeah. He also points to the quantity of published experiments that attest to the capability of the human body for maintaining proper water balance. End oh. quote. Hmm. So let's unpack all that. First, scientific studies indicate drinking that much water isn't required. Second, the water that makes up other liquids does hydrate you, so don't believe that coffee or soft drinks aren't providing you with water, as they are almost 99% water anyway. Yeah, I've heard that uh, stated a lot. Um, what about alcohol? Alcohol is also mostly water. So, so alcohol hydrates you more than it dehydrates you? Correct. Okay. Up to a point, yeah. but yes. Now, some people are worried about the caffeine, but you shouldn't be. The same thing that Adam was concerned about for alcohol. Caffeine content is not high enough to act as a diuretic, something that increases urine volume. That's mm -hmm. all a diuretic means. Yeah. It's not like if you have a can of Coke, you'll end up excreting more than a can of urine. It doesn't yeah. work that way. The levels of caffeine would have to be much, much higher to have any effect that would actually lead to dehydration, which seems unlikely, and you'll probably have a bigger problem from all that caffeine. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I probably I, hear someone say that once a day. Yeah. A coffee and tea is a diuretic. Which mm -hmm. it can be at high enough levels. So that's the grain of truth that's misapplied. Now, third, the human body does a decent job of maintaining water balance. This means that most people have an internal signal for how much water they should drink. It's called thirst. <laughs> if you are thirsty, drink some water. If you are not, you don't have to. If you are not thirsty but still want to drink some water, you can do that too. Hmm. Of course, we all might know someone that gets very absorbed into tasks, such that they even forget to eat over many hours. So those people might need an overt indicator, aside from themselves, to regulate their system a bit more. Further, if you're trying to prevent kidney stones or doing strenuous physical activity, or are on a long airplane flight, or the weather's very hot, you probably want to drink a bit more water than usual. Darren, do you have any idea where this arbitrary eight glasses of water comes from? Excellent question. Where did this belief come from? Valton thinks the notion may have started when the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Research Council recommended approximately, quote, one milliliter of water for each calorie of food, which if you think about a 2,000 calorie diet, that'd be about two liters of water or eight cups. Aha, right? Yeah. But wait, in the next sentence, the board said that most of this quantity is contained in prepared foods. Right. Yeah. That's right. The water content in food counts as well. Many foods are largely water. Fruits and veggies typically are over 90% water, but even meat has water in it. So in conclusion, you do not need to drink eight glasses of water a day. While we humans do require water, the water in food and other drinks helps keep us hydrated. Unless you have a medical condition, it's very hot out, or you're exercising a lot, you don't need to drink more than what you feel you need. You can, to embrace this rare opportunity to quote an accurate ad slogan, obey your thirst. <laughs> so it sounds like if I'm eating nothing but like beef jerky and like, you know, protein powder, and maybe some like uh, dry cat kibble or something like that, <laughs> then I would need to drink eight 
cups of water a day, but that's really not the reality of what I usually eat. Correct. Even dried food would have some water, but obviously a lot less, yeah. especially if it's kibble versus dried fruit. Sure. Which is why cats need to drink a lot of water, right? Mm-hmm. And now, Christina, has 2016 been atypically bad for celebrity deaths? Hmm, certainly seems that way so far, huh? So, after David Bowie, Prince, and more recently, Pat's hero, Muhammad Ali, passed away, mm-hmm. I heard a lot of people say, me included, okay, enough 2016. Hmm. A few go so far as suggesting that 2016 is cursed. While it's true that the number of celebrities who have died this year is oddly high compared to the last few years... Is it really worse? A couple of major media outlets have published stories about this in the last couple of months, including Time Magazine and the BBC. A BBC report looked at the number of obituaries published this year in comparison to the same time last year. The basic stats show a very clear upswing of notable deaths in the first three months of 2016. According to research by BBC Radio's program, More or Less, it jumped from only five between January and late March 2012 to a near five times increase of 24 in the same period this year. However, if you look at Time.com's archives, the number of celebrity deaths reported so far this year is pretty consistent with the number reported over the same time frame last year, with 21 in the first three months of 2016 versus about 24 last year. So why do some people have this perception that more celebrities are dying this year? Well, it depends on what you mean by celebrity, I guess, right? That's true, and I will get to that too. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. first, there's a few things at play here, actually. If there's been a notable upswing in celeb deaths, it can be attributed in part to pure chance. Basic statistics teaches us that similar events sometimes occur in clumps, and other times they don't even occur at all. Using notable deaths as an example, the number reported may be high for a period of time, then suddenly drop for no extraordinary reason. So when averaged over a longer period of time, the total number of deaths may actually be quite unremarkable. Using 2015 as an example, even though more people may have died by this point, as the year went on, the rate of famous people dying fell. Another thing to consider is the baby boom factor when we saw a big growth in the population. The U.S. Census Bureau claims that 76 million people in 2014 belong to the baby boomer generation, which is about 23% of the population. More babies means there are more people who can potentially become famous, right? So it's also noteworthy that people born in that time frame or who became famous in the 60s and 70s are now in their late 50s to 70s when the odds of dying are higher. If you look at some of the major deaths this year, Bowie was 69, Ali was 74, Prince was 57, and actor Alan Rickman, who played Snape in the Harry Potter franchise, was 69. I think that's a great point, Christina. I think there's probably a background underlying assumption that people are making, which is that there's an equal amount of people born each year in the past decades, and there's an equal amount of famous people in each year also that come from that birth year, which makes Mm -hmm. no sense whatsoever. As you said, the baby boom was a huge cohort. Also, there's just a lot more people now than there used to be. So as a ratio, there should be even more celebrities dying perhaps in 50 years, depending how you determine celebrities. Right. But yeah, it's this underlying assumption of like, yeah, sure, there's the exact same amount of people who are famous each year. From birth. And there's just also like an age of celebrities, right? Like celebrities sort of came into being um, later in the century, I guess. Exactly. And we can also thank the explosion of online media feeding this perception, right? So thanks to increasing media outlets on the internet and popular social media platforms, news gets shared way more quickly and widely than when we relied mainly on print newspapers or magazines. Mm-hmm. As well, outside of being a musical artist, if you weren't on TV or in a movie back in the day, you really weren't that famous. So the definition of what constitutes being famous has also evolved over time because you can include people like the Kardashians as an example. Right. <laughs> Are you saying there were fewer sex tapes in the 1800s? <laughs> <laughs> in the 1950s as well. There's also the level of celebrity someone is. Many famous people who have passed away this year are more world-renowned and well-loved than many of the actors or celebrities that died last year, for instance. Mm -hmm. So all of these factors may give us the impression that there's an increase in notable deaths when there really isn't. Mm -hmm. 
Now, according to Gizmodo's James O'Malley, who breaks down various data criteria, if you take an average number of notable deaths per day so far in 2016, and you use that as a basis to project the number of notable deaths over the entire year, and celebrities keep dying at the current rate, then this year would indeed be worse for celebrity deaths. Well, that's a lot of ifs. But that's a lot yeah, of ifs. Right. So, and yep. let's hope this trend does not continue. Sure. So it's really more a winter 2016 issue than a 2016 issue if this cluster is sort of more uh, focused and restricted in time than the entire year. I think the answer is that randomness is clumpy and this is a clump. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. fair. That's fair. Yeah. Do cell phones cause cancer? Great question. So, do people really still believe this? I had originally investigated this issue back in 2008. Basically, I'd seen a news piece on TV that discussed a new study which apparently showed a link between cell phones and cancer, and I wanted to investigate it. A lot has changed since 2008, but belief that cell phones cause cancer has somehow not gone away. (laughs) It's not one of them. No. So cell phones have been around for that long and many more years, and people do use them a lot differently these days. When cell phones were new, it was easy to say, we don't even know if that'll cause brain cancer or something like that. Um, But, you know, they just aren't that new anymore. So the arguments that people made sort of out of ignorance back in the, the early 2000s aren't really that legitimate. Secondly, while cell phone use has increased dramatically, the way people use them has changed. People use their phones more and more for texting and using the internet, and less and less for making actual phone calls with the phone up against their head. Or playing Pokemon Go. That's the latest way to play it. Or even if they do (laughs) use them for phone calls like me, they use earbuds. Yeah, or speaker, or hands-free, all sorts of of things. Um, So, will a cell phone cause brain cancer? That hardly seems like a worthwhile question, as I hold it in my hand or pocket while it sends and receives drastically more data on a daily basis. Cell phones do send and receive more radio waves while making an actual phone call than while texting or being idle. Um, So this is sort of where part of the concern comes in. But still, people use their phones for data so much more. That's got to add up to something. So first we got to ask ourselves, is there a biologically plausible explanation for this effect? Scientifically, what would be the mechanism of cell phones causing brain tumors? Ionizing radiation. Exactly, Pat. So there are two types of radiation. There's ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation is the bad one. So we're talking things like x-rays, radon, uh, cosmic rays from space. So one should limit their exposure to ionizing radiation because it can increase your risk of cancer. Ionizing radiation hits DNA, causes mutations. Bad things can generally happen. We've all seen Fantastic Four. Yeah. Great movie. (laughs) And not so great movie and another not so great movie. There's a lot of research out there trying to show a link, but there's been no consistent evidence that non-ionizing radiation increases cancer risk. That's not to say that non-ionizing radiation has no effect, but the main effect that it has is heating, not mutation. The effect is low, so you're not going to be boiling your brain with your phone with the low levels of non-ionizing radiation they produce. In addition to this biological evidence, we can do some lab studies. So these are studies on animals or cells in a dish to see how they react when exposed to high levels of radiation that are similar to what a cell phone would produce. So non-ionizing radiation exposed to these things. There are a lot of studies like this. Many show no effect from cell phone-like radiation. One, such as a study where rats were exposed to high levels of RF radiation for nine hours a day for a two-year period, show a mild increase in growth of tumors. This particular study by the U.S. National Toxicology Program showed no increase in female mice. These results are always mild, suggesting that there is either no risk or a very small risk. Now, let's remember that so many other things also emit non-ionizing radiation. Radio waves, TV signals, Wi-Fi, walkie-talkies. There are people that are, to one extent or another, afraid of the consequences of these as well. But these are things that are around us every day. 
I'm going to have to seriously reconsider my walkie-talkie usage. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it's just that these have been around for so long. So you can't use the, you know, the, we didn't know that smoking caused cancer at first, but now we do. Well, radios have been around for a really long time. TVs have been around for a lifetime. So there is not much of a plausible mechanism, but we can admit that there may be an unknown mechanism. So studying the effects of non-ionizing radiation on animals, there seems to be little or no link. What about people? This brings us to epidemiological studies. Does cell phone use correlate to tumors? Usually more specifically brain tumors is what most people have been investigating. So basically we can analyze data on whether or not people who have cell phones have cancer. Or more simply, find people with brain tumors and compare their cell phone use to those who didn't have any. Most studies of this type do not show a link between brain tumors and cell phone use. Studies also do not show a dose-response relationship, and this is important. Basically, this means that if a person used a cell phone more, it does not correlate with an increased risk of cancer. This is an important metric, since this is how a lot of correlations work. A person that smokes twice as many cigarettes will have a significantly higher risk of developing lung cancer, for example, and you would be able to correlate the risk to the dose. Some studies do find a link, though they are uncommon, and they don't show a strong link, and there are potentially other factors at play. Income may vary historically, even though most people have cell phones now, this may not have been true a decade or two ago. So if uh, you're studying people and you say someone's had a cell phone since 1995, well, there could be other factors there. Many studies have methodological issues. If there's a very small sample size or some other factors aren't controlled for, the results may just not reflect reality. You have a lot of research out there, and when there is a link, it will make headlines. But when there is none, the paper will not get attention and possibly not get published at all. We see small studies like this all the time going viral on social media. A single study is practically useless, as almost anything has been shown to cause cancer in small numbers in studies, but you never see very strong links or replicated research for most of these things. Larger, more thorough studies examining large groups of people over a large number of years generally finds no links. Experts generally either state that there is no proven link between cell phones and cancer, or that there is a very weak link at best. All said, these concerns haven't done much. People don't seem to have stopped using cell phones. You can buy devices that don't really do anything to protect you from your phone, but these don't really seem to be all that popular considering how prevalent cell phones are in our society. Cell phone risk of cancer and brain tumors is low to non-existent. While people have been using cell phones for years, no research has been able to show a significant risk from use of such devices. Beyond this, there is no plausible explanation for how this kind of non-ionizing radiation would cause negative effects from a biological point of view. Your cell phone may put you at risk of getting into a car accident, but when it comes to cancer, there isn't much to worry about. So Adam, one of the more interesting aspects of what you've talked about is ionizing versus non-ionizing radio waves and microwaves versus other sorts of mm -hmm. things. Um, what's the distinction? It's 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 basically from a sort of from a molecular point of view. So ionizing radiation is radiation which will cause the substance that is exposed to it to be ionized. So there's just there's just a a, a fundamental difference in the way it interacts with matter. Um, that you don't really need to worry about the effects of non-ionizing radiation on your on your DNA. Right? Great coverage, Adam. I especially liked how you talked about the dose-dependent relationship because mm. we all know that correlation is not necessarily causation, but when there is a dose-dependent relationship, it is certainly one of the indicators that something could be causal. Yeah. As well as, of course, the good old publication bias <laughs> that you won't usually hear about the one study that didn't make it, even if it was published, let alone someone on Facebook heard this thing from this who knows where research institute that said it does cause it. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this again. It, it, it came back in the news again, and it was, it was that study I touched on. Not strong evidence, but the way people see the headline, that it seems more significant than it is. Well, we already know that many people do not read beyond a headline, <laughs> so... It's uh, a lot more um, salacious when you can share something like that, yeah. right? Thanks for listening. On this show, I covered that you don't need to drink eight glasses of water a day. Obeying your thirst is pretty much sufficient. Christina looked into whether there have been more celebrity deaths this year, 
And while there have been, in a clumping statistical sense, it probably is not going to hold for the entire year. And finally, Adam looked into whether cell phones cause cancer. And the main point is, no, they do not, or it's very, very mild. Or everything causes cancer. Well, exactly, compared yeah, to what? Exactly. <laughs> Until next week, think better to act better. Peace out, cuboids. Stay classy, not smartassy. Good night, everyone. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. I added an S, which made it more confusing for myself. Just like Superman, he adds the S. <laughs> it means hope. <laughs>